Uh, yeah, thank you, Janice. It, it has definitely been a hard week around here, and, and once again, the service is at 2.30. If you can make it, I know that would mean a lot to the family. Uh, just, um, just lean into God during this time. So church has been through a lot lately. I said that last week, and man, it just seems like it keeps on coming. But God is good in the middle of it, and uh, we're going to lean into him. So I, I'm, I'm going to start off today uh, a little different than uh, we normally do. I actually have a guest that I'm going to invite up, but I want to tell you a little bit b before I do. He's going to share real briefly about something that he's doing. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of a story about Mike Mastin. A lot of you in here know Mike, and I couldn't say Mike's name without saying Christine, uh, but Mike and Christine have been a part of Buncombe Street for a, a good long while and have been worshipers here, and he shared his testimony um, a while back, and after sharing his testimony and through the course of some other events, uh, he received confirmation, affirmation, uh, that he was uh, called to uh, be a pastor. And so Mike pretty much immediately um, went to the conference and said, I want to preach. <laughs> um, and he's preaching. And he's preaching every week. And, I mean, my hat is off to him. It's amazing. And the Methodist Church has a whole process of how we actually do this. But he is in the process of becoming um, a, uh, a, a licensed local pastor, maybe an ordained pastor one day. We'll see what, what, uh, where, where it all lands. But um, I wanted Mike to come up today and share a little bit. And I'm going to tell you this as he come, makes his way up here. Um, I just wanted to share for a few minutes about the things that he's doing in his church. And what you may not know about Mike is that Mike uh, was just diagnosed just a few weeks ago with colon cancer. And he had major surgery this week, was in the hospital yesterday um, and said he still wanted to speak today. So it tells you that he's hard-headed, um, but a lot of pastors are. So Mike, you, you take, and, and I know we got some pictures you want to show, but uh, thank you, brother. We appreciate you, and you take, take a few minutes. Well, thank you, Justin, and it's great to be back amongst our family here at Buncombe Street. It's such an honor to see all your faces again, and, and I want to thank you for all your prayers and support this past week, especially, as we've been dealing with this uh, colon cancer. But I did want to take a few minutes. Justin has been mentoring me in, in such a way where if I ever have any questions, I get to call him and pick his brain. <laughs> and I want to thank you for that, Justin. But I did talk with Justin about sharing our experience as we minister to the two churches over in Gray Court. And it just so happened that I was able to come today since they, they, I wasn't able to make it to the church in Gray Court today. Uh, I figured it would still be in the hospital. So, so they had someone fill in for me. So this Lord's works in mysterious ways, that's for sure. Uh, but we, I think we, we may have some pictures to Put up on. Yes. When we went over to uh, Gray Court, they were uh, really short handed. Uh, the, the members, this is kind of a family church with a few extra members, has really been carrying the burden and just, just got drained. So it was our, <clears throat> our intent to relieve some of that burden off of them and help get them re energized and refocused and build up their hope and their passion. So we had a ladies' paint party night that Christine led for us over there, and she got to, <clears throat> well, you see the pictures. Everyone had a great time. It was open to the community, and the donations that were accepted from the paint party actually helped build a missions and outreach fund, which there was not one. So that was a great start. Uh, second picture, you see, we, we had the T-shirts made uh, thanks to Bill Mulligan. I, I don't know if you know him. He made these shirts for us at a really great price. And this is us standing out at Grace Court uh, Family Fun Day as we reintroduced our church to the community. You see, we had a large banner made. I mean, you'd be surprised at how many people asked us, where's your church at? <laughs> it's right, the next street right off Main Street. So 
that was a great experience to to welcome them back. Uh, seekers class here at Buncombe Street. Uh, this was a hymnal dedication that we had, where that was head headed by and more, and all the donations. Uh, from the hymnals that were raised, there was 56 were from the members of the Seekers class here at Buncombe Street, uh, United Methodist Church. And it was a very emotional service for the members at Gray Court. There's, there's quite a few tears involved that they wondered how, how could one, you know, somebody love them so much that don't even know them. So this is a picture, or this was a picture of uh, what one part of the body of Christ supporting another part of the body of Christ looks like. And this led to so much excitement and hope that we actually ended up having a uh, church cleanup day. And they wanted to re re represent the church to the community. And just get the church, you know, back alive and energized and welcome anyone that the Lord may see fit to bring through the doors. So we're doing great work and we want to thank you for your prayers and support and ask for your continued prayers and support. And I want to thank you, Justin, for mentoring me along the way. Thank you, sir. Just hold on a second. Uh, um. Yeah, as you can see, uh, I think Mike and I know Christine are doing some awesome work. And, you know, I want to challenge you if you feel like you may be called to the ministry. I want you to think about that. You know, we, don't, we, we haven't had a whole lot of people come out of this church into ministry. I want you to think about what that could be because Mike, uh, just a year ago, was not standing in a pulpit. And uh, today he is. And here's what I want to do today, Mike. Where's Christine? Christine, you mind coming up here? We're going to pray over you guys today. I think that would be worthy. I want to invite some folks forward. Uh, whoever wants to come, anybody come forward this morning. Let's not make Mike come off the stage. Y'all come up here. We'll lay hands on him, he and Christine, and pray uh, for them this morning. Don't squeeze him too tight. All right. Uh, Father, we thank you, uh, first of all, for Mike and for giving him life, Lord, breathing in him the breath of life and creating him with the gifts and talents that you've given him. And thank you the same for Christine, Lord. We know that somewhere along the lines, uh, his life and your call intersected. We just give you praise for that, Lord, and thank you for placing him in the pulpit. And I pray that you will continue to give him many days, Father, of, of blessing, many days of preaching the good gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you give him and Christine strength to love on people, to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, and soul, and to love their neighbor as their self. We just ask for complete healing today. We pray that the surgery takes care of any and every problem in his body, Lord, and that you restore him to full health. We thank you for Christine. We thank you so much, Lord, for all the ministry that she's doing, and most of all, for continuing to help uphold Mike and speak words of encouragement to him, Lord. And as all good wives do, Lord, speak the truth when he needs to hear it. Father, we just love you, and we give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into the series that we've been in. It's our, it's our second week in the series. We're in a series called The Word. Uh, and in the series, we've been talking about just the importance of God's Word. And last week, if you weren't here, we talked about the importance of studying God's Word. So we talked about how the Bible was actually put together over a 1,500-year period with uh, some 40 authors and some 66 books. And so we talked about, amongst all of that, why it is that we can still trust that it's God's holy and sacred word. So this week, we're actually going to be talking about the importance of living God's word. So we're going to talk about the importance of taking all the theology 
that, and I've got several Bibles here, I'll talk about that in a minute, but we're going to talk about taking all the theology in this book and actually applying it to your life. Because if there's one thing that I've learned is that theology is great, but if we don't make theology applicable, then most people in the pews are like, eh, what's in it for me? So I'm going to start off by setting it up like this and explain to you why it's important that our theology be applicable. So things don't become important until we understand, once again, how they're applied in our life. And I'll use this example. I, I am not great at math. I've never been great at math. I can do simple math, but when it comes to stuff like algebra, geometry, calculus, I still have recurring dreams about those classes. Does anybody else have those dreams? Isn't that weird? Like I'm in the class and I'm like trying to pass it and I can't do it. And that's so weird. So there's something I need counseling about there. But um, So when I, when I was in high school and college, I really struggled with these classes. And one of the reasons I think that I really struggled with them um, is because I didn't know how to apply them to my life. So I just remember taking these classes, especially, you know, some of them like... Um, statistics and some of these things, and I would just sit in there and I would go, okay, what, like, what in the world? Like, who uses this as a pastor? I want to become a pastor. I'm like, never going to use this stuff, right? And so um, I, 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 one day I had this revelation um, that math could actually be applied to my life. And I remember where I was. My dad and I were building a barn on our farm, and um, we were actually at the point where we were building the trusses. So if you don't know what the trusses are, the trusses are the part that holds up the roof um, on, on a building. And I remember we were sitting down there, we were working on them. And I, I don't remember all the circumstances, but I do remember that I had um, two sides of the triangle uh, of the truss. And, and I knew two of the sides, but I didn't know the third side. And I remember my dad said to me, he said, well, you know the Pythagorean theorem, right? And I was like, I actually do know that. And it was A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? Remember that? And he's like, all we have to do is use the Pythagorean theorem. He's like, if we know the squares of two sides, the sum, you know, the sum of the two sides, and we can figure out the, the third side or whatever. And so I remember having this moment um, where I said to myself, this is actually applicable, and it has purpose. And it changed the way that I actually saw the Pythagorean theorem, the reason I tell you that is because I think a lot of times when we have our Bible, we have it, and the reason that we're not interested in it is because it doesn't seem to have any practicality in our life. And we hear preachers preach about it, and they talk about it, and they talk about these verses and these parables, and we go, yeah, but you haven't shared with me how it is that I'm supposed to live that out and make my life a little easier and a little better and a little more meaningful and give me a little more hope and a little more encouragement. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, is why the Bible can be like that for us. Because I think the truth is, many of us have grown up in church and in Sunday school, and we've heard all the scriptures, and we've heard all the stories, but until somebody goes, man, here's how A squared plus B squared equals C squared actually works in your life, you go, I don't really care. Because the truth is, the Bible was actually given to us, not just to read, it wasn't given to us so that we have a holy stack of papers between some leather. In fact, I've heard it called before, it's just a tree between two cows, you know? It's like you get it, just a tree, it's just a paper between two cows, that's all it is. It's just, it's just paper with some ink on it between some leather, if, if we treat it like that. But the Bible was given to us so that we know how to love God better and love our neighbor more. And, you know, the pages and the bindings, what I'm saying is not what's holy. And when I first started reading the Bible, I remember that I took a legalistic approach to it. So it was a very legalistic approach when I was 12 or 13 years old, and I started reading it daily. And I remember thinking to myself that I had to read three chapters a day, and if I didn't read three chapters a day, because that's what the Lord had put on my heart, if I didn't read those a day, that he was disappointed. He was disappointed in me. How dare I not impress him by reading three chapters a day? I thought that I could impress God. You know, sometimes it's funny. We think that we can impress God. We can't impress God with our reading. I mean, God wrote the thing. It's not like he's impressed by me reading three chapters a day, right? And so I can remember that I had this approach where I felt like I had to, um, I, I, I had to just read it and, and, and get it done. And it was, it was the devotional time that I had to have. And, um, and, I, and I truly believe that sometimes we idolize the reading and the memorization of the Bible more um, then we idolize the actually receiving and living out of the Bible. 
Because the goal of the Bible is not uh, simply to retain it. The goal is to receive it. It's not to retain it. The goal is, is to also receive it. Otherwise, we become like Pharisees and Sadducees who know the Word of God, but we're not applying the Word of God. Is anybody hearing me this morning? Is anybody hearing me? Good, good. I hope I'm speaking the language of some of you. Because we said last week that the Bible is our instruction book for life. So it's our instruction book. In, in 2 Timothy, it tells us all Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says all Scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Listen to this. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped... In other words, given the tools for every good work. So how do we do that? Well, I would submit this to you to begin. And here's what I would suggest you write down. We cannot apply what we do not know. This is where we have to start. We cannot apply what we do not know. So like we said last week, the first step in living out the Bible is becoming a student of the Bible. When I got my first Bible, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it in just a second. When, but I remember when I got my first Bible, I opened it up. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to open yours up right now. If you have your phone, you can go maybe to your table of contents. I want us to talk. I want you to open up your Bible to the table of contents, whatever you got. You got your phone or your iPad or your Bible. I want you to look at the 66 books that we have in our Bible. We talked about a lot of these last week and why they're there. But I remember looking at my Bible and looking at the 66 books, and I remember going, man, where in the world do I start? I mean, I didn't know anything about it. I was coming to it as a brand new student. I didn't know what any of the books were about. I didn't even know what the Gospels were, none of those things. Well, now, on this side of it, after studying it 25 or 30 years, I've learned where to turn when I need help. I have, I have a pretty good sense. Now, of course, I am a, a pastor, so I should. Um, but I hope that you do too, a pretty good sense of which, bo which books to turn to when I'm struggling. For instance, I'm going to kind of give you a test this morning. If you're going through a trial, and it seems like life has fallen apart, and uh, everybody around you is dying, um, and uh, you are in pain, which book of the Old Testament might you turn to? The book of Job, right? So if you hear that this morning, you're struggling, you're going through a hard time, I would suggest that you turn to the book of Job and listen to Job's story. Um, if you are wondering about your relationship with God and where in the world you came from and how the world began, which book of the Bible would you turn to? Now, my wife can't be the only one that answers. Which book? You turn to the book of Genesis, right? So Genesis is about our creation, it's about where we came from, it's about where the world began, how God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. If you wanted to know in the Old Testament how to worship God and how the people of Israel worship God, which book of the Bible would you turn to? So I heard somebody say Psalm, Psalm might be one of them, but which one is all about how God created the temple and how we treat the temple and how we set the temple up and how he gave instruction for the Israelites to worship? Which book of the Bible is that? It's Leviticus. So Leviticus is so interesting and so fun to read if you want to learn about how God gave instructions about how to worship. You should check it out. It actually can seem kind of boring at first. It's one of my favorite books. If you want to know about the meaning of life, where, why, why we're here, and, and, and should we or should we not obtain all this junk, and why we have all this junk called houses and cars and money and fun, which book of the Bible would you turn to? You turn to Proverbs, you can turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. It's about Song of Solomon. Remember the same guy who wrote Song of Solomon? It was, it was Solomon. A song, a song, remember, y'all remember the remember he married 700 wives? You remember the story? Remember this? I talked about it last week. But it's got the whole book of Ecclesiastes. It's all about the meaning of life, and we obtain all of these things. And at the end of it, what's the purpose? If you're struggling with material possession right now, you can turn to Ecclesiastes. If you just need some wisdom, and you need some good one-liners to use on your husband or wife, which book of the Bible would you turn to? The book of Proverbs. You know that one. If you just need some help praising God, and you want to give God some praise, which book of the Bible do you turn to? The Old Testament, the Psalms, right? If you want to live a life like Jesus, we go to the New Testament. You want to live a life like Jesus. You want to live a life of service and generosity, 
a life of gratitude, which books of the Bible would you turn to? You turn to how many Gospels are there? There's four Gospels, and they're Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what does Gospel mean? It means the good news, right? If you want a book in the New Testament that explains the Gospel, and explains salvation, and explains grace, and explains faith, and explains how you come to know Jesus, which book of the New Testament would you turn to? It's the book of Romans. In fact, if you don't know it, I'd suggest you study, maybe you study it as a couple. Romans chapter 8. It's the entire, entire Bible in one chapter. It's one of the best books of the Bible, in my opinion. And if we want to learn how to live a life together as a church, in other words, if we can't all seem to get along as a church, and we've got arguments about uh, how we do church, or what church should look like, or we're wondering about speaking in tongues, or we're wondering about um, how to worship together, which books of the Bible do we turn to in the New Testament? What are they called? They're called the epistles. It's almost all of them. It's the letters of the New Testament. It's all the things that end with the ends. I'd especially encourage you to turn to General Electric Power Company, which would be Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It's the way I remember it. But anyway, I learned that as a kid. So the Bible not only gives us the answer to these large things, but it gives us the answers to the small things. Sometimes we wonder about how we should be married and what our marriage should look like. You could turn to Ephesians chapter 5. You might worry about how do you deal with conflict in your family or how do we deal with conflict in the church. I would encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. The Bible tells us about how to receive joy. It tells us um, how to keep good friends. It tells us how to raise children. It teaches us all of these things. And what I'm saying to you is that we first have to become a student of the Bible before we can live out the Bible. So this is my big Bible, and I said last week, a lot of you laugh, but I said this is my big Bible and I cannot lie. It's the truth. This is my big Bible. But also, and, and, and just out of practicality for you, this may sound elementary, but I think this is important. Everybody in here needs to have a good Bible that they can study. So when I started out, when I started out, my first Bible was this one right here. It was given to me by this church, Buncombe Street United Methodist, and they gave me, I think this one, this is actually the NRSV. I think my other uh, home church, I was, went to two of them, uh, gave me the King James Version Nithis, and I read it this 500 times, I couldn't understand it. But, um, but, but I remember this one didn't have a whole lot of things in it that were very, that were very applicable to me. So I just remember opening it as a kid, and um, the only thing that really stood out, there were some pictures in the back of some tools um, that people used in Bible times. But then when I was about 13 years old, my, my mom gave me a Bible, and it was called this Teen Study Bible. And I want to tell you, if you have children in here, don't give them the King James Version. Um, get, give them a good Bible. Invest this worth $40, $50 to get a really good Bible. And in it, it talks about everything in here from prayer to addiction to sex. And I can remember turning to these things during my times when I didn't want to talk to my parents or anybody else. I would suggest that you give this one of the best gifts that you can give to your children. One of the best gifts that you can give to your spouse um, is a good study Bible. Uh, I love this NIV study Bible. It has a common commentaries in it. it it's got um, just, it's very, very applicable. It's got the study notes in it. And you may say, Justin, I know all this, but listen, I'm just encouraging all of you. Make sure that you have a good Bible. If you're not a student of your Bible, you need a Bible that you can understand and that explains a little bit of life. So, I want you to open your Bibles, if you have your Bible, I want you to open it to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I want us to look at this story real quick. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, if you're like I was at one point, and didn't know anything about how the Bible was put together. Um... This is a scripture that I think is excellent. We talk about living out the Bible. Uh, this is a story about Jesus being tested in the wilderness. Now, if you've been in church your whole life, you know this story. You've heard it many times, but Jesus um, <clears throat> is actually led by, by God. Uh, this is right after his baptism. So it's interesting, just pay attention that a lot of times uh, a after we give our life to Jesus Christ, after we receive salvation, um, immediately we're, we're tempted by the enemy. So what happens to Jesus? Immediately after he's baptized, he faced temptation. So I'm going to read this to you, and I want, I want you to see how Jesus responds to temptation in his life. I want you to see what he does, because he leans into the word of God. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, everybody hear that? 40 days and 40 nights. This isn't like he's gone, you know, two hours in a church service and he's got to get to Tupelo honey. I mean, that's not, that's not what we're talking about here. It's 40 days and 40 nights. It says, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written. I want you to say that with me. It is written. So what's he doing? He's turning to the scriptures, right? He says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So my Bible says that Jesus is quoting, my Bible shares this with me, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 8.3 there. He's quoting the Old Testament. It says in verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. Now listen to this. For it is written. Now, what's the, what's the, what's the devil trying to do? He's trying to use the word of God against Jesus, isn't he? He's trying to use it against Jesus. He's, so the devil says, it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So the devil is using the word of God against Jesus, which I find is really interesting. They're getting into a scripture battle. I don't think I'd want to do that with Jesus. Now, in verse 7, Jesus answered him. What? It is also written. So this is a scripture battle going on. So it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So he shuts the enemy down because he's making the scriptures applicable to his life. And then in verse 8, it says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in all their splendor. All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. Say it with me. For it is written... Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Three times, Jesus uses the scripture to battle the enemy. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. So three times, Jesus himself battled Satan with the word of God. What I'm saying to you this morning is that if we have the word and we know the word, then we can use the word in our life. But we have to know the word. and We have to understand how it applies, which means that we have to spend time in it. We get into a sticky situation. We have to know how to live out his will for our life. But in order to live out his will, we have to understand it. Um, you know, a lot of us, last week we said that the Bible's like an instruction book. And I talked about how my washer and dryer, I tried to put in without the instruction book, and it leaked. You know, and a lot of you tried to give me washer and dryer advice, and it wasn't good. But anyway, um, the problem with instruction books, though, is that truly many of us don't want to read them. We don't want to take the time to read them because it's easier. It's easier. Listen, we think that it's easier just to do the trial and error method. And when all else fails, read the instruction book. But that's the problem. When all else fails, we read the instruction book versus starting with the instruction book to preventing the failing. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn over to Deuteronomy with me. That's, um, well, y'all can help me get there. We start with the very beginning. Turn to Deuteronomy, we start with what? We go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. If you're in confirmation and you're in here, I hope that you can say these books of the Bible with me. Y'all probably know them better than us as adults. But Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 through 21. Uh, when we go to Deuteronomy, we, we said last week that it's written by Moses. It was the law, the first five books of the Bible. And so um, at this place in Deuteronomy, really the whole book of Deuteronomy, Moses is getting ready to hand over the leadership of the Israelites to Joshua. Uh, we know that Moses dies at the end of Deuteronomy. Uh, you see the promised land, but he doesn't get to enter it. And so he's handing over all the laws, and, and he's talking about loving and obeying the Lord, and he's speaking to all these generations that are going to come after him. And here's what Moses says. <clears throat> Moses says in verse 18, he says, Fix these words of mine in your hearts and in your minds, and tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore 
to give your ancestors, as many as the days as the heavens are above the earth. So I, I think Moses is trying to drive home a point. I mean, basically, he's like, you know, what? Uh, tie them on, on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, teach them to your children. Listen to this. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. I think what Moses is saying, we need to know the Bible. He's like, it's so important that you talk about it with your children and that you talk about it as a family and that you understand you know God's word. And my challenge to you today is do you talk to your children about God's word and do you read it as a family and do we ever open our Bibles at home? I'm not judging, I'm just asking. It's a challenge for all of us. Do we really do it? Do we open it and do we read it and do we study it together and, and do we use it as a lamp into our feet and a light into our path? Because all the way back from the very beginning of time, all the way back, Moses is saying this. He's saying that we need to open it and we need to live it together. And I think the reason Moses is saying this is because the word, once again, um, helps us know how to live life. I mean, like when you're driving and somebody cuts you off. I mean, sometimes what goes through my head is, what would daddy do? That's not good. <laughs> or what would the person on the YouTube video do, right? Versus what does God's word tell me to do? How am I to live? Let, let's use another example. Let's say that we're dating someone. You know, the Bible actually has a good bit to say about dating um, and, and a good bit to say about, about being yoked with, with unbelievers um, and, and about how we treat our bodies. And if, if, you, you, if you're here and you're dating somebody and you're young and you get into a situation um, and, and, and things are hot and heavy and you go, what would my friends do? Or do you go, what does God's word say about my body and my temple and how I treat it? What I'm saying to you is that the Bible is applicable if we know it. Let's flip over to the New Testament. This is the last one. I want you to flip to um, Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 3. Corinthians chapter 3. Corinthians was written by who? It was written by Paul, right? Who was he writing to? <laughs> the Corinthians. <laughs> Sorry, this just hit me as funny. <laughs> yeah, he's writing to the Corinthians, right? He's writing to the Corinthian church, the church of Corinth. So, 1 Corinthians, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to hear this, and we'll, and we'll wrap it up after this. But I want you to hear this. Um, <clears throat> if you, you haven't found 2 Corinthians, you go past all the Gospels, Acts, Romans, and then you're there. But 2 Corinthians... Uh, chapter 3, I, I thought this was really interesting. I was studying this text this week, but um, the Church of Corinth was a new church plant, and I want you to keep in mind they're planting a church, and they, um, they didn't have the New Testament. So imagine planting a church today, and you don't have the, the, the Bible. So you've got the stories of Jesus, and you've got the Holy Spirit, but you don't have the Bible. And so the church was asking Paul, remember, this is a letter um, from Paul to the church. So the church had already written Paul a letter. Paul's responding. They've asked him for a letter of recommendation. So back in Paul's day, there was a lot of heresy. Pe people were teaching crazy doctrine. They didn't have the New Testament to compare things to. They asked Paul, they're like, we need a letter of recommendation from you, Paul, because you're a legitimate New Testament preacher who everybody trusts. Just write us a letter of recommendation. Here's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. Totally underline this in your Bible because it is great. Here's what Paul says, reference to the letter of recommendation. You yourselves are our letter. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter of Christ, the result of our ministry. Listen written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Listen to that. You are the letter. You're written on our hearts. You're known by everyone. You show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, listen, but on tablets of human hearts. Here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, listen, you don't need a letter of recommendation from me. You just live out the gospel. You know who Jesus is. You have the Holy Spirit. You live it, and other people will see it. Now, listen, they didn't have the New Testament, but we do. And here's where I'm going with this today. Here's what I want you to hear. We are living testaments of Jesus Christ. And the reason that we are living testaments of Jesus is, number one, because we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
If we didn't have that, we wouldn't be getting anywhere. If we don't have the Holy Spirit in this church, might as well hang up our hats and end everything. We've got to have the Holy Spirit. Nothing's in our own power. But here's the other thing I want you to tell you. If you know this word and if you, if you, if you live and breathe and read and study this word, you will live it out and you will become a living testament for Jesus Christ. You and I are the walking word today because we receive and we accept this and we believe that it is true and it is legitimate and that we live it out in our lives. And if we live this out, people will understand that we are Jesus incarnate, that we are Jesus, the body of Christ. Not Jesus incarnate, but we are Jesus, the body of Christ. You and I are him. We are the body, and we have to live, and we have to trust, and we have to know that this is the inspired word of God. And what I want to encourage you today is that if you're not opening your Bibles, man, I, I just want to ask you with me to open them and to study them and to trust that it is God's holy word. I mean, God's word is good, and it is sacred. And it is holy. And I just want to ask you this morning, I want to challenge you, man, are you putting it first in your life? And I'm challenging myself with it too. Are we putting God's word first? Because if we don't hear from him, we won't take time to study him and to know him, we can't live for him. I'm just going to invite you this morning, man, just going to, a simple invitation this morning. If you just want a time maybe to recommit yourselves to the reading and the studying of God's word. Something I need to do from time to time is just to restore my passion and somebody to remind me of the holiness and the sacredness of the living word of God. So we're going to have simply, we're just going to do this. We're just going to have a time this morning of prayer and a time of invitation. I'm going to invite Craig and Elizabeth up this morning. I just want you to think about this morning. Maybe there's somewhere in this message that you're hearing, man, I just need to, need to open God's word back up with my family, or maybe I just need to open it up myself and spend a little time alone with the Lord. You know, sometimes we get busy. I was thinking about myself this week, you know. Um, you think about God as our Father, and the Father wants us to spend time with him. Um, there's nothing I love more than spending time with my children. And so one thing I want you to think about this morning is how much time are we spending with the Lord? Um, you know, I give my kids instructions all the time. They don't always follow it. Sometimes they do. Um, but this morning, I just ask you, you know, what instructions has our Father given us? And, um, and are, are we listening to it? Uh, he's given us this great gift called his word. And, and I just want to pray over, you, pray over you this morning and uh, invite you to, to hear from the Holy Spirit. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you this morning, Lord, that you've given us um, the holy and sacred word of God. I thank you, Lord, that you've called us to live out this word on this earth, Lord, that you've called us to be the body of Christ. Uh, Jesus, I just pray for the word of God uh, to be evident in folks' lives. I, I pray that we sit down and spend time in it, Lord, that we soak ourselves in it so that we can hear from you, that we become students of it. Uh, Lord, as we enter into this time of prayer today, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit work. I pray that it move amongst your people, Lord. I pray that if folks are struggling with something other than the word today, Lord, they feel comfortable coming forward to receive prayer from our prayer teams. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Uh, Father, if someone here doesn't know you, Lord, I just pray that they can receive you unto them, Father, by acknowledging today that you are Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Ask for the forgiveness of sin, turn from their ways, and seek after you. Pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. I have our prayer teams in the corners today. If you want to come forward and receive prayer, we'd love to have you come. We'll be glad to pray with you.